Hey, Tyson here from Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee. Thank you for listening to our message today. Refuge Church is a family of faith sent to proclaim hope in Jesus Christ through relationships. For more resources and information about Refuge, please visit us on the web at refugeph.com. We've been talking about this um, series called Identity, and we're starting off talking really to men. Today is going to be sort of towards men. Uh, Women are in this as well, in some respects. Um, But as we look at this idea of identity, we started off looking at how we are created in the image of God, how God (coughs) created us different than everybody else. We have the ability to make moral decisions. We have a spiritual part of our life that, that nothing else that's created has. And, and we're created in this image of God. And that uh, we're going to look at today that part of being created in the image of God is we're to be image bearers. Uh, we're to bear that image out to other people. So we're going to look at that a little bit today. Last week we looked at how men are to be cultivators, not consumers. That in our world today, <coughs> men are judged by how they consume. How many beers you drink, how many women you consumed. Pornography is a, is a consumption type idea, but, but men are not called to be consumers. They're called to be cultivators. That, that they're not to consume things, but to help things along, to, to serve other people and, and, and those kind of things. So we looked at that last week, and uh, today we're going to look at this idea of men and our leadership responsibility. Men are called to lead, and we're going to look at this from the very beginning, and part of that leadership comes responsibility. That's part of what leadership is, and then we're going to look at how we lead out of that and what our identity is coming out of that. So we're going to start in Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 15. So we're going back to the beginning, because that's where it all got out of whack. And we're going to look at how it got out of whack, and we're going to realize that we do the same things... And then we're going to see how God fixes it coming out of that and what that does for us, okay? So Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. It says, The Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to watch over it. Now, we looked at this last week, this idea of to work it and to watch over it. And we use this word called cultivate. That it's, a, it's the idea of tilling the ground working it so that it produces for other people and protecting it and caring for it. It's not just a one-time deal (coughs) that it's part of our calling is to continue to cultivate. And that's the idea, to watch over it, to protect it, to shepherd it. Verse 16, and the Lord God commanded the man. Now let me stop there. Who did the Lord God command? The man, okay? The woman has not been created yet. So let's Lay this out. The commandment came to the man. And he said, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for on the day you eat of it, you will surely die. So here's the command. Adam, you're free. You can have all these things. Look at all these things that I've created for you. And out of all these things I've created for you, there's really one thing that you cannot have. Now, we think that God's rules are meant to uh, dampen our fun. That he's got all these rules that I can't do this, I can't do that. But understand, from the very beginning, there was one rule. And let's be clear, if there was one rule for us, we would break it. But these, these things that God has for us, these commands, they're actually good for us. Because the command here is that if you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, what does death mean? Death in the Bible has to do with this idea of separation. We're going to see this. um, Well, we're not going to see it today. But if you continue on in Genesis chapter 3, God uh, puts Adam and Eve out of the garden. They're separated from God. Sin separates us from God. That's part of the death part. When we die physically, our soul and our body separates. It's the idea of separation. So this... This sin, like Adam, if you disobey this, it will cause separation, death. Ultimately, Adam physically dies. Ultimately, we all will physically die barring the return of Jesus Christ. And it says, uh, but, if you, uh, if you, uh, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for the day you eat of it, you will certainly die. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper corresponding to him. So you see, now he's said, okay... 
I've given man freedom and I've given him a command, he's going to need some help. So he's going to create uh, a spouse, Eve. And you can see she's not been created yet. So, so the, from the very beginning, this command goes just to the man. So there's a, there's a leadership responsibility given to Adam that he's supposed to pass this command down to his family. It's part of his obligation to do that. Now, he does that. He actually tells Eve the command, and we'll see that in just a minute. But he is going to be held accountable for what happens. So let's read on. Let me read verse 18 again. It said, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper corresponding to him. The Lord God formed out of the ground every wild animal, every bird of the sky, and brought each, of the, <coughs> each to the man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called the living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky, to every wild animal. But for the man, no helper was found corresponding to him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. The Lord God made the rib that he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. We had a pastor here many years ago. He used to call his wife his prime rib. And this is why. It's his prime rib, right? Verse 22. Um, it, it says he took her out of the rib, he brought her to the man, verse 23, and the man said, this one at last is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken from the man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds to his wife, and they become one flesh. Both the man and his wife were naked and felt no shame. Now there's a memory verse for you, if you want to memorize that one. The men are like, I'm going to memorize that one. But here's the deal. This idea of Adam and Eve, they were joined together. They became one flesh. Let me talk on this just for a minute. This really doesn't have anything to do with the main sermon, but I want to make a point here. When I do weddings, I typically use 1 Corinthians 13. You probably know this passage. Love is patient. Love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it does not seek in its own way. And it gets to the end and it says, love never ends. And this is the idea of marriage, is that true love is something that never ends. And this is the idea of marriage, is that it's an eternal unity. I use the wedding ring as an example. It is a continuous circle, it has no beginning and it has no end. And that's the idea. So <clears throat> this idea that the two become one, they're together. This is why when divorce happens, it hurts. Because it's a tearing of two who were one. It tears one apart to become two. It's what makes divorce so painful at times. And, and, and we should try to avoid that at all costs, right? And, and this is what he's trying to show us. Now let's, let's move on. It, in the very next verse, it goes to Genesis chapter 3, and let's see what happens. It says, Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the animal of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say? Now let me say this. One of the first attacks of the enemy is to get us to question what God says. Did God really say that? We take things that God didn't say and we claim them as things that God did say, and then we take the things that God did say and we question, did he really say that? So one of the first attacks that comes is on the truth that is from God's Word. So we need to be people of God's Word so that we know the truth, okay? So he says, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said you must not eat of it or touch it or you will die. So obviously... Adam passed this command down to Eve. She understood (coughs) the command. Now, she added to it a little bit. The command was, don't eat it. And Adam, maybe he warned her and said, hey, listen, don't eat it. Matter of fact, don't even touch it. So she sort of adds to God's word there a little bit. Uh, But she says, listen, don't eat of it. Um, uh, It says in verse uh, verse 4, he says, no, you will certainly not die. So this is attack number two that happens on the truth of God's Word. It becomes, first of all, you question, did he really say that? And then it becomes, 
Well, did he really mean that? Is that what he really meant? I mean, let's be honest. We, we, you know, how could have God foreseen what's going on in our world today? Does God really mean that? Yes, he does. He does. And, and that's what happens, right? This attack on truth becomes about what he meant. He meant what he said. How's that? Let's just leave it at that. He meant what he said. So, so that's the, the second attack. No, you certainly uh, will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And here's the third attack that happens. Did God really say that? Did God really mean that? You know, you can make decisions for yourself. You can be like God. Why don't you decide what's best for yourself? Is that not where we are in our world today? Is people deciding what's best for themselves, regardless of what God said? I mean, this is the attack that comes on truth. You can be like God. You can make your own decisions. You can do whatever you want. If it makes you happy, do it. That's the world that we live in today. But it's, op- it's in opposition to what God has said. He, the serpent said, you will know good and evil. Well, the truth of the matter is, when they eat of this fruit, they will personally know evil because they will have committed sin against God. Verse 6, the woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it, and she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Now, a couple things in this verse. It was good, she thought. Desirable. She thought it would be a delight. We've talked about this a lot uh, here over the last several years. Jeremiah talks about how our heart is deceitful above all else. This is one of those things that leads us down the wrong path. As we see things and we think they're good, we think they're a delight, in the moment they bring us pleasure, but they're against what God commands. See, we can't live by just doing whatever makes you happy because happiness is separate from joy. Happiness is in a moment, but it can have serious consequences down the road. And this is the idea That this attack on truth is that for Eve, it looked good. It was desirable. I think I'll try that. You know, God doesn't really know what's best for me, so I'm going to try it. Now look at the rest of this verse. She also gave some to her husband who was with her. Don't miss that part. He was standing right there. And he ate it. So what's the deal here? At the end of the day, Adam passed this command down to Eve. She knew it. But Adam stood right there and failed in his leadership. Men, I want to tell us something. This this applies to women also. When we know the truth and we don't stand up, we fail in our leadership role. We are to be truth speakers. In love, but we are to understand the truth and to speak it in love. Uh, Adam had a leadership obligation to stand up and say something. We're going to see who God goes to here in just a second. He doesn't go to Eve. He goes to Adam. Look at this. Verse 8. It says, "The man, uh, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. Remember, you eat of it, you will surely die. It will cause separation. Well, the first part of this separation that happens is Adam and Eve are now in shame. They've broken the command of God. The holy God who loved them, who created all these things for them, who blessed them with all these things, comes to speak to them, and they hide from Him first. That's part of this separation. We talk about this, how sin brings Shame on us. That's part of what Jesus came to conquer was that shame. He took that shame from us. That's why I say this all the time as Christians. That when you sin, you don't have to run from God. You can run to God through Jesus Christ. He removes that shame. That's part of what he does. But they hid from him. Verse 9. So the Lord God called out to the man. Who? Who did he call out to? The man. 
The Lord God called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. They had shame. Verse 11. Then he asked, Who told you you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man replied, The woman you gave me. So what does the man do? He blames the woman. Not only that, he didn't just blame the woman. He blamed God. He's like, it's the woman's fault. But by the way, you gave her to me. And see, this is what happens. We play the blame game. It's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. Right? And this is, this is the idea. But God went to Adam because he has a responsibility. And here we continue to see Adam trying to push his responsibility off to somebody else. This is the woman's fault. God, matter of fact, this is your fault. He says, the woman you gave me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate. So the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. At the end of the day, what happened here is this is a failure of leadership from Adam. He should have stood up in that moment and said no. This idea of husband... We, we didn't talk about this a minute ago, but that word is first used in the Bible right there in Genesis chapter 3. And, and this word for husband, it can be translated man, it can be translated servant, champion, it can be translated steward. That's the idea of a husband is to be the champion, the steward. And men are like, yeah, that's me. But listen, part of being a champion is rising up and being a steward is rising up and doing what you've been called to do, and that's to stand up when time, when it's supposed to be. But at the end of the day, Adam failed to lead. He played the blame game. I submit to you that one of the number one problems in the world today is men not taking responsibility for their leadership roles. Share some statistics with you. The number of children living in fatherless homes has doubled in 50 years. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 18.4 million children, one in four, live without a biological step or adoptive father in the home. That's enough children to fill the city of New York twice. Now let that sink in. In fatherless homes. 85% of youth who are in prison currently grew up in a fatherless home. Does this mean that women are failing? No, not at all. Quite the opposite. Women are doing as, as good of a job as they can do. But here's what I want to show you. Two is better than one. If you don't believe me, I'll bring a unicycle in here and let's see who can ride it. <laughs> the point is, is it takes at least two. It honestly takes a village, does it not? I, I, could, I could take a poll in here. The hardest thing you will ever do as a human being is parent another human being. And the church said, Amen. It's the hardest thing you will ever do is parent a child. You can bring up two children in the same home and they'll be completely different. Sometimes I think parenting is overrated because they can be completely opposite growing up in the same environment. It's the hardest thing we will ever do and to think that we can do it better alone is a failure of what God's design was. It's meant to be done together. These two that become one. And I want to encourage us as men Part of our job is to rise up in that responsibility. We're to be the protectors, the shepherds, the champions. And part of that means we should not let the enemy sit at our table. We need to control what comes into our homes and what our kids see and and what they hear. We need to be controlling of that. We need to tell kids when when we see things that are not truthful. We need to point it out. We need to use those as teachable lessons. We need to guide them. These failures that that we as men have done over the past years have have created consequences, has it not? And and maybe uh, as men, listen, we've all failed. I I told you this last week. It's easier to pastor a church than it is to lead your home spiritually. It's easier to pastor a church than it is to lead your home spiritually. We've all failed in some way, somehow, one way or another. We all wish we could have done better. And and in some respects, we're living with those consequences. But I want to give you some hope. It may not change your circumstances or the consequences, but I want to give you some hope. And it comes directly from this passage. Let's continue on. I want to show you 
something here. Despite Adam and Eve's failure, God gives them hope. Look at this, Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than any livestock and more than any wild animal. <clears throat> you will move on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. I will put, put hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. This last verse, verse 15, is the first proclamation of the gospel in the Bible. That a descendant from a woman, Jesus, will crush the head of the serpent, who will strike at his heel. That takes place at the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The serpent thinks that he's killed Jesus, but the ultimate victory is Jesus. He crushes his head. And this brings us hope that there is forgiveness for us when we have failed. But there's more than that. There's more than just forgiveness. What we need is the ability to do better. And we're going to see that in 2 Corinthians uh, 15 and, and, or 1 Corinthians 15 and 2 Corinthians 5. So let me go to 2 Corinthians 15 and I want to show you that uh, Genesis chapter 3 is about the gospel. Verse, 2 Corinthians 15 verse 21. It says, For since death came through a man, that's Adam, the resurrection of the dead also came through a man, that's Jesus. Jesus is the greater Adam. Where Adam failed, Jesus didn't fail. Jesus lived the perfect life. Where Adam, through Adam comes death, through Jesus comes life. Resurrection from the dead. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits after, at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So we will live eternally with Christ because of what he did. But I want to give us some better news than that. This alive that happens is not just something that happens after we die. We get to be alive now. The, the, rest of, the rest of this verse, look at verse 24. It says, Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, when he abolishes all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. He crushes them. The last enemy to be abolished is death. For God has put everything under his feet. Now when he says everything is put under him, it is obvious that he who puts everything under him is the exception. And then it goes on to say in verse 28, that so that God may be in all, may be all and be in all. That, that this idea that this passage in Genesis chapter 3 is talking about how the descendant of the woman will crush the enemy, that happens through Jesus Christ who puts everything under his feet. But there's good news for us now, not just in the future. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says, From now on then, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective, even if, if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective, yet now, no longer, yet now we no longer know him in this way. They were judging Jesus Christ from a worldly perspective, that he wasn't the Messiah. But now they know differently because he rose from the dead. They don't judge him in a worldly perspective, but in a spiritual perspective. Look at verse uh, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and see that the new has come. Now here's where the good news is for us today. <clears throat> is that when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ... He begins to make us new. Sometimes we don't like who we used to be. Sometimes we don't like who we are. Part of what God does when we put our faith and trust in Him is He puts His Holy Spirit inside of us and it begins to transform us from the inside out. So I have a question for us. Yes, this is for men, but it's really for all of us. Is God making you new? Is He transforming you from the inside out? I say this all the time. If you can sin and it doesn't bother you, that's a major red flag. Because part of what God does is He convicts us of our sin. He points out our sin. He disciplines those He loves. So my question is, is God making us new? But there's some advice in this passage. 
He's going to make us a new creation. He's going to change us where we're not somebody like Adam who plays the blame game and who doesn't stand up and do the right things, who lives for themselves. He begins to transform us. He says he's going to make us this new creation. And look at the order it happens in. The old has passed away. The truth of the matter is this is the hardest part. The old man doesn't want to die. The old person that lives inside of us does not want to die. This is why Jesus says we must take up our cross daily and follow Him. We have to submit our lives to Jesus Christ every day. It's a constant battle. That old man wants to come back. That old Adam wants to come back. The one who blames. The one who shirks his responsibility. The one who doesn't do what he's supposed to. The one who doesn't lead. He has a hard time dying. And I'll be honest with you, it's painful. It's hard. It's, It's a hard process. And it says the old passes away and then the new has come. God uses the Holy Spirit in our life to to kill the old man that's in us and give us new life. He makes us alive. He makes us a new person. Is God making you new? I'm going to ask TC and uh, Cameron and Danielle to come up here. And I want to finish with the rest of this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at verse 18. It says, Everything is from God who has reconciled us to Himself through Christ. Remember, If you eat of it, you will surely die. You will be separated. If When we sin, it separates us from God. But this verse says that we can be reconciled with God through Jesus Christ. This is what He did for us. And He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. First of all, fathers, to you. You are a minister of reconciliation if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. It's your job to to point your family to God. Not only that, it says that is in Christ, God is reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against Him, and He has committed the message of reconciliation to us. We are to be messengers of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, men. We claim to be Christians and we live in our homes. The picture of who our kids think God is, they're going to get that from us. We are the ambassadors. If our kids have a misguided view of God, it may be because of us and how we've lived our life. We are ambassadors. We represent Him. It says, since God is making His appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled with God. Me and God's wanting us to, to stand up, to be champions, to lead our family, to protect, to cultivate, to not put our responsibility onto somebody else or blame other people. He's asking us to rise up, to be ministers of reconciliation. God making His appeal through us. True ambassadors of who Christ is. That's who we should lead in our, that's how we should lead in our home. To be cultivators and not consumers. And that comes with being disciplined. I I want to encourage the men to participate in this Bible plan that we're doing this week. It begins to set a discipline to spend time with God on a daily basis. That's how we're transformed from the inside out. Is God doing something in our life through His Word. And then for those of you who don't know Jesus Christ, I'll finish with this last verse. It says, He made the one who did not know sin, that's Jesus... To be sin for us. So that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. That God put our sin on Jesus so that we can be made righteous. You want to be a new man? You want to be a new woman? Put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and let the Holy Spirit work in your life. And you'll be a new creation. The old passes away and the new has come. So my call to you today is to be reconciled to God if you don't know Him. If you do know Him, men, it's time for us to let the old man pass away. It's going to be painful. And it's going to be hard work. But when we spend time with God and we let the Holy Spirit do something in our lives, He'll begin to change us. Would you stand with me? Here's our invitation today. It's, it's, it's a couple of different things. This week is an important week for Brittany and Jeremy. 
And I'm going to ask the church to pray. If you want to come down to the altar and pray, you can do that. Uh, But I'm going to ask you to pray for them again this week. That this is the week that she comes off of the ECMO machine. I'm going to ask you to take part in this Bible plan as a church. We'll go through this together to begin to build discipline in our lives. To spend time with God. And, And maybe you want to come down and pray for your husband. Maybe as a husband you want to come down and pray for your family. That God would continue to make you new. But that's our challenge today. Let's pray. And then, uh, yes, God, we come to you today, God, just humble as we look at Adam. We see ourselves in Adam. Somebody who's failed in their leadership role. Somebody who plays the blame game. Somebody who was not a champion. Who was not a steward. And God, we need your forgiveness. God, we need help leading our families and our our homes and our communities spiritually. It's one of the hardest things we'll ever do. And God, we cannot do it without you. And God, we're praying that you continue to make us new, that this old man in us would die. We would put him to death so that this new spirit that lives inside of us can have room to move and work and live and transform us. We pray that we spend time in your word and that we pray that you begin to work in our lives and we begin to hear your voice and speak to us and that we obey that we take up our cross daily and follow you. That's our challenge. And God, we pray that as men we rise up and do what you've called us to do and be responsible and take the lead and take responsibility. Thank you for listening to this message today brought to you by Refuge Church. Please visit our website for more resources as well as our YouTube channel. Just search for Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee to find us. We hope that this message has helped you find hope in Jesus Christ.